Hello, I'm Esther Gidu Ewart. It's Monday, August 14th. This is Africa 54. Niger's junta says it intends to prosecute ousted President Mohamed Bazoum for high treason following his imprisonment last month as the regional bloc ECOWAS explores options to restore civilian rule in the country. The death toll from the Maui wildfires reaches 96 as relatives of the missing continue searching for their loved ones and firefighters battle flare-ups in parts of the island. And former U.S. President Donald Trump stares at a potential fourth indictment of election interference in the state of Georgia. We'll have a report. All this and much more coming up on today's Africa 54. Niger's military junta that seized power in a coup last month says it will prosecute ousted President Mohamed Bazoum for high treason over his exchanges with foreign heads of state and international organizations. The coup leaders have imprisoned Bazoum and dissolved the elected government, drawing condemnation from global powers and neighboring West African countries, which have activated a standby military force that could intervene to reinstate Bazoum. The video statement by junta representative Amadou Adromane, which provided no evidence, came at a moment of high tension as the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, explores its options to restore civilian rule in Niger, including potential military intervention. If found guilty, Bazoum could face the death penalty, according to Niger's penal code. Today, what we're going through is not a witch hunt. Because even when you look at the army, the army itself, let's face it, is not all holy. But they themselves are obliged to work together today and should do so for the good of Niger and a bright future for the country. They saw the mobilization of the population. This means that today, it's the people who are encouraging the military to work for Niger. And everything that needs to be done must be done for Niger. Meanwhile, Bazoum's political party says his family has no access to running water, fresh food, or doctors. The ousted president told Human Rights Watch that his son needs to see a doctor because of a serious heart condition. The military coup in Niger, unlike other previous ones in West Africa, has elicited strong support from the nation's young citizens. VOA's Anthony Labruto spoke to Zakario Kanda, a Nigerian native, on why the military takeover is seen as a unifying an inspiring event for young people. Mm. When people ask me, uh, are you for the coup or against the coup, I mostly respond, I'm 100% supporting the coup. When I say I'm 100% supporting the coup, it's, it doesn't mean like I'm asking for, for coups to happen in Africa. That's not something we can wish for. But mm. like, uh, I've lived in like red line zone, actually. If you take our country, we have like the western part and the eastern part facing terrorism. Mm -hmm. And we say for more than 10, day, 10 years that we're fighting against terrorism. But once you go on the field, you will realize that terrorism is even entertaining by that politicians. It, it, it's just like people are saying they're really fighting, but they're not there. The one reason that people are supporting mostly the coup is also uh, when you take the country generally how it is, we don't possess our own electricity. The water, we do not have control over it. There's less job opportunities for young people. So like mostly when you see those people um, uh, like outside, it's young people that are supporting the pool most of the time. Hmm. It's because they don't see light, they don't see opportunities. And it becomes in our country that corruption is like legal. What are you, what are you hoping that the coup, you know, yeah, the coup will change about the, you know, the future of Niger? I think if you take the like the Sahel region, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, we say we share the same realities. We 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 are like the same the same people, if I can say the same people. We are all fighting against terrorism, mm -hmm. but like those terrorists are gaining more and more space in our countries, just because we're not really fighting on the field. We're just saying we're fighting, but reality is we're just there, nothing and. When they see uh, foreign soldiers in the country, they don't feel secure and they can't explain that having more than like, for example, 1,500 soldiers from France 
not being able to tackle and finish with terrorism in less in more than 10 years is like we're not really fighting against terrorism. Do you think that they're going to change like the change the outcomes that's been happening that France or you know uh, like uh, the European colonial powers couldn't do? We need to diversify also our partnerships. If mm. French soldiers are not doing the job, then we can also ask for someone who is ready to do the job to do the job correctly, to come and do the job. And this is the hope. This is really the hope that people have. It's like, okay, once those Russian soldiers arrive, they're going to help us fight against the terrorists and in real, on the field. I don't know if it pays, but like, it's just a try. That was Niami resident Zakario Kanda speaking to VOA's Anthony Labruto. For more insight into Niger's political crisis, I'm joined live via Skype from New York by David Anserio Monda, a professor of public policy and constitutional law at City University of New York. Professor Monda, welcome back to Africa 54. Thank you for having me. Now, what should we make of the junta's declaration that it will prosecute ousted President Mohamed Bazoum for high treason and his exchanges with foreign heads of state as well as international organizations? I think uh, we can make of it that uh, it's a very dangerous situation because uh, we see the junta centralizing its focus on uh, President Bazoum, or former President Bazoum, and it's done this in two ways. In number one is uh, focused on the former president as uh, a center of um, a buffer for the regime in case there's foreign intervention. They promise to execute uh, president, uh, former President Bazoum. But then the other thing is they have also used the former president as a prosecutorial tool because they've also promised to try the president. And if he's found guilty on sedition charges, then the president will also be killed. So we see in both these contexts, the life of the former president is in danger. And it's really going to complicate the current political division in Niger even more in the events that uh, former President Bazoum is, uh, is killed. Professor uh, Bazoum's ouster appears to lead to democratic backsliding, as well as uh, the concern that the Wagner Group may infiltrate Niger. Uh, should people in Niger be concerned about uh, this infiltration or polarizing of the country? And uh, should Nigerians act according to what they think should be the right path to democracy? Yes, I think this is a very uh, dangerous situation because, uh, as you've mentioned, it's a, a situation where we have democratic backsliding. Niger in the Sahel was seen as uh, one of the promising countries for uh, democratic governance. President Bazoum was uh, the first elected, democratically elected president for a long time. Niger has previously had uh, five military coup d'etats. So this, in, in effect, is really returning the country back into the hands of the military. In other words, the military has not accepted its subservience to civilian rule. But it's also a challenge because when uh, Niger falls into military hands, it continues that domino effect regionally. Niger is surrounded by seven different countries. Uh, and we know in the Sahel region, from Guinea all the way to Sudan, all these countries have suffered military coup d'etats in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So it's really an unfortunate day for democracy. I think the important thing to think about here is what happens in a country when democracy stops to be the only game in oh. town. In other words, <laughs> the alternative is military dictatorship. Uh, I think this is something that uh, we really need to think about going forward, particularly in the case of the Sahel countries like Niger. Professor, thank you very much. Wondering how this huge crowd of people are supporting the military, whether it's genuine or out of fear. Thank you very much for your insight. Thank you for uh, inviting me today. David Donserio Monda is a professor of public policy and constitutional law at City University of New York. The war in Sudan, which began on April 15th, has killed over 1,000 people and displaced millions, according to the Sudanese Health Ministry. The war is also wreaking havoc on the education system as national end-of-year exams have been cancelled. Alice Rizzo has more. 
Sudan's conflict, which began mid-April, has pushed the country's education system into a state of collapse. Many schools have either shut down or been repurposed to host displaced people. Now in Chad, Sudanese medical student Arafa Ibrahim says she's back to point zero. I started university in 2017 and I did not graduate until now because of the problems in Al Janina. Last thing, they destroyed the university and destroyed us as well. We don't have a future now. We are now back to point zero, as if we have not studied anything at all. The conflict has brought daily battles to the streets of Khartoum and the displacement of more than 4 million people within Sudan and across its borders. According to the United Nations, at least 89 schools across seven states are being used as shelters, raising fears that many children will not have access to education and could be exposed to child labor and abuse. Arif Noor is Sudan's country director for Save the Children. There have been reports of uh, children being uh, recruited for uh, by different armed actors. And we have also uh, have had reports of uh, sexual abuse uh, on a fairly uh, wide scale uh, in different parts of the country. So uh, yeah, both of these things uh, have now been reported fairly widely. On Wednesday, the education minister also cancelled most end-of-year school exams in war-affected areas. Even before the war broke out, Save the Children ranked Sudan as one of the top four countries globally where education was at an extreme risk. According to estimates, there were close to 7 million children who were out of school uh, before the conflict uh, broke out. And now this number has gone up to close to 9 million children who are in need of education uh, support. Uh... That was Alice Rees of Reuters uh, reporting. Days after an inferno destroyed much of the historic Hawaiian resort town of Lahaina in Maui County, firefighters are still battling flare-ups in canyon areas near the upcountry town of Kula, east of Lahaina. The death toll from the Maui wildfires has reached at least 96 as relatives of the missing continue to search for their loved ones while survivors grapple with the scale of the disaster. The rising death toll made the blaze Hawaii's worst ever natural disaster, surpassing a tsunami that killed 61 people in 1960, just a year after Hawaii became a U.S. state. It was also the largest number of deaths from a U.S. wildfire since 1918, when 453 people died in Minnesota and Wisconsin, according to data from the National Fire Protection Association. Now to Zimbabwe politics. For voters, the upcoming elections provide an opportunity to exercise their democratic right to cast their ballot for leaders who align with their values. But what's at stake? VOA's Paul Ndiho spoke to Chipo Dendere, Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Wesley College in U.S. state of Massachusetts. We are a week and two days away from the election. Uh, it's what we call a harmonized election, which means that it's the presidential level, parliament, senate, and council level as well. This will be Emerson Nangawa's second election, and um, if he wins the last term that he will serve as president. The opponent, where I think a lot of your young viewers might find interesting, is Nelson Chamisa, the young candidate for the largest opposition party in Zimbabwe, the Triple C, the Citizens Coalition for Change. This is also Nelson Chamisa's second election running for president. Uh, the difference is that this time he's running as the leader for Triple C, which is the party that he founded uh, just over a year ago. There's a lot of excitement on the ground. You know, both parties, uh, ZANU PF and Triple C, are having uh, frequent rallies. Uh, so they've been rallies every single day. Nelson Chamisa has been having three rallies a day. I mean, he will go from one end of the country to another uh, in a space of 24 hours. Um, but ZANU PF is not trailing behind. They have large, large billboards all over uh, the country. Um, and so, you know, they are giving voters uh, fast food, chicken, uh, making 
on both ends making large promises. It looks like uh, it's a repeat of uh, what happened the last time because these are the same very issues that uh, these two guys were actually uh, campaigning on the last election. In some ways it feels the same but there are significant uh, differences. So the ruling party I think has worked very hard to close political space. It's different, you know, it's not 2008 levels of violence that we've seen in the past, but it's the jailing of opponents. It is that journalists don't feel like they can report information. It's that, you know, even though the opposition is having these big rallies, most of their rallies have actually been uh, banned. I think a lot of people were hoping that in the post Mugabe era, there would be more democratization, there would be more opening of political space, but we're seeing that political space is pretty closed. And for some reason that the ruling party seems concerned that they cannot win in a free and fair election. The ruling party is concerned that they cannot uh, uh, win in a free and fair election? How ironic is that? Well, I played with the words, right? It's that if the election is free and fair, they can't win. And so they are putting all of these obstacles to secure their own win. I think the people in the country, they are excited. Um, the ones that plan to go out and vote. I think people are excited. Anytime you have an election, it's an opportunity for change. But there's also a lot that's happening at the parliamentary level. I think Zimbabweans vote on, on the opposition and on the ruling party side. They are frustrated with their MPs as a collective. And so we're going to see perhaps some disappointment for some MPs, whether in the opposition or in the ruling party. Uh, so I think there are going to be some surprises even at the local levels of elections. Uh, you are calling for a peaceful election. Uh, let's hope it stays like that. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your insight. Thank you, Paul. That was Chipo Dendere, an assistant professor of Africana Studies at Wesley College, speaking to VOA's Paul Ndeho. Tertiary institutions across Nigeria have concluded the 2022-2023 academic session. While the new session will resume in August, what lies ahead of the students is a tuition fee hike that may prevent many from going back to school. Gibson Emeka reports from Abuja. 22-year-old Benita Olonio is a fourth-year law student at the University of Abuja in Nigeria capital. Paying her old tuition fee of $82 was a struggle. She even worked as an intern to support her expenses. Oluni Yosku fee just got raised to $146. That is threatening her education as she cannot afford the new amount. Oluni Yos says she may even take on petty trade to augment her income. To pay the school fees is an issue, but I had to delve into entrepreneurship because of the increment of school fees to try and see if I could meet up before the next section comes. The government has been financing public universities in Nigeria that kept the learning costs low for students, but all that changed when the new administration said it could no longer afford tertiary education. That means self-funding students from low-income families may drop out of school. Deborah Idowu, a student in one of the Nigerian universities, says she cannot cope. I am a self-funding student. I am sponsoring myself through school. And if the increments rub off on me, I, I, I don't think I'll be able to further. It, would, it, would be, it wouldn't be easy for me to further. Parents with low income are also struggling to afford college fees that have surged by over 100% in most schools. Samuel Ayongo, a middle-level civil servant and a father of three university students, say he may need to make difficult choice. It is really a difficult situation. That so we are discussing already on what step we will take. That is myself and the children. But personally, if this thing remains the way it is, I have no choice than to drop them then we'll see what we can do with the few or one that will remain. Then others maybe will take to skills. I think that will be the only option to go with. The move to increase school fees was triggered by the rising cost of operation, a fallout from the recent first subsidy remover. Abubaka Umar, a professor and a dean of student affairs at the University of Abuja, urge the government to reconsider its decision on tertiary education funding. The government can fund tertiary education. If government will fix wastages 
uh, if government will uh, prioritize and if government is sincere uh, education is one of the basic needs and no country in the world surrenders education to uh, to the dogs or to the whims and caprices of the so-called market forces. We are not saying that government alone should fund it, but government should subsidize it. Nigeria Tertiary Education has suffered instant strike action due to long dispute between the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, and the government over low wages and welfare benefit. With the current high inflation rate, Education sector watcher says hiking tuition might cut many from acquiring higher education. Gibson Emeka for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. You're watching Africa 54 from The Voice of America here in Washington. Still to come, will former U.S. President Donald Trump be indicted a fourth time? We'll have a report right after this break. In other news, police in Malawi say the suicide rates are rising. Police data shows that for the past five years, suicide cases in the southern African country jumped from 128 in 2018 to 292 in 2022. Police records show that more youths are committing suicide than older persons. Britain's National Crime Agency says the president of Madagascar's chief of staff and an associate are being charged with bribery offences in Britain following a police investigation. The two are accused of seeking a bribe from a British mining company to secure licences to operate in Madagascar. Sierra Leone security forces killed two dozen civilians in August of 2022 in violent protests against inflation. Now relatives of the dead are pushing to hold the government accountable. An investigation committee appointed by President Julius Marda Bio called the violence an insurrection against the central government. Prosecutors in the U.S. state of Georgia are presenting their case in front of a grand jury on Monday against former President Donald Trump over election interference. View is Veronica Balderas Iglesias reports. Security measures are tied in Georgia's Fulton County ahead of a possible fourth indictment of former President Donald Trump. It is expected that Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis will present her case to a grand jury this week. She has been investigating whether Trump pressured state officials to alter the 2020 presidential election result and plot to use fake electors. The former president calls the Georgia probe a witch hunt. Top voting official Gabriel Sterling, who helped with the 2020 presidential election recount in the state, could be called to testify in the case. He appeared on ABC's This Week show. We counted the ballots three times. He lost this state and he continues to say he didn't lose it. And it's just creating a lot of tension and a lot of chaos. Sterling was asked if Trump's strong public criticism of District Attorney Willis could lead to some kind of violence. It's not going to be a bunch of conspirators together. It's going to be one probably mentally unstable individual who's going to be radicalized through this process. If the former president is indeed indicted in Georgia, voters will need to carefully assess his 2024 presidential bid, said Republican presidential candidate Chris Christie on ABC. And what I think Republican voters have to ask themselves is two things. First, 
is, is he really the guy under indictment in four different cases, given the conduct that he committed, someone who can beat Joe Biden or any other Democrat in November 2024? President Joe Biden is himself under investigation for allegedly mishandling classified documents. A special counsel was appointed last week to more independently investigate the president's son, Hunter Biden, on his foreign business dealings. Democratic Representative Jamie Ruskin commented on the case on ABC. We all seem clear that this guy was addicted to drugs and did a lot of really unlawful and wrong things. And we have said, let the justice system run its course. After Hunter Biden's recent guilty plea agreement for tax evasion and illegal gun possession unraveled, the prospects of his case heading now to trial are much higher, according to prosecutors. Veronica Valderas Iglesias, VOA News, Washington. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching. assistance will uh, affect uh, development aid to the government, security aid to the government. Um, it's a significant amount.